So who knew last week when we were talking about the tangible kingdom and being community and how it's uh, sharing something in common and also reaching out to bless those that are in the community that within hours we'd be we'd be practicing that on a level that we haven't had to really experience before. Um, Kevin mentioned, if you don't know, uh, we have a family in church who lost their full-term unborn child uh, on Sunday night. And <clears throat> obviously it's been a difficult road and we have people in this family here who have experienced similar things in the past in their own lives, and so that's been uh, drummed up and, and brought back. And so we've had serious opportunity to just minister to one another um, and for those that have that in common, for them to minister to each other. And so uh, thanks for being a, a family. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, how to do that for people that aren't in our community. Uh, because... It's not just people in our church that are hurting. So, <clears throat> if, uh, if you got your Bible, or your phone, or whatever you read it on, um, turn to Acts, and it's in your note sheet, but I'd prefer that you actually just pick up your Bible. Uh, because right before what we're going to read, the church is, is just starting. And we'll go back a couple times, but there's, you'll see that the church... Uh, spends a lot of time together. They look out for each other's needs. They have, you know, things in common uh, that there are, there are no needs. People are selling fields and things that they own to make sure that people who don't have enough have enough. And uh, right before this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who are some people who sold what they owned, and um, and then they brought what they'd earned and they gave it to uh, the disciples to uh, distribute. Uh, and yet they kept some of it back. It's kind of like you know, hey, we made a really hefty profit, and so nobody's going to know any better. You know, we sold it for a quarter million dollars, so we'll just give them 200000 and say that's what we made. And uh, long story short, that doesn't go well when you lie to God, and so he strikes them dead, and uh, everybody's like, whoa. And so that's, that's where we pick up. That has just happened. And in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 12, now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Okay, and so, I don't know if I can make this point super strongly, um, you know, just biblically. Um, but it sticks out to me, and so I'm going to make it anyway. And, uh, and you guys can weigh it. I'll do my best to, to explain what I'm thinking. This is why I wanted you to have your Bible. I want you to turn back to chapter 2. Okay? And in chapter 2, at the very end of chapter 2, starting in verse 42, you, many of you are familiar with this verse, um, here's what it says. Um, they, meaning the, the new believers about 3,000 from verse 41. Um, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So it's no different than what we just read in chapter 5. And all who believed were together and they had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the needs to all as any had need. And day by day, Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So here's what they're doing. They're living out what we talked about last week, all together in community, having everything in common. Nobody has needs. They just take care of one another. They're very in. And then verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord 
added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. The, the Lord added to their number. They're all focused on loving each other. And God is adding to their number day by day. You go a little bit further. Go to chapter 4. And now go to verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed, okay, so this is the believers, the people who are on the inside, the, the community of faith. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all, and there wasn't a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them, and they brought their proceeds of what was sold, laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. So again, we're, we're looking, they're all about them. They're taking care of their own. And then with what we read in chapter 5, you see that verse 14 there, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitude of both men and women. But they were out doing things in the community, and this is why people were coming to faith. And so the, the first thing I want you to write down and, and the, the thing I just I want us to get, and we did very well this week for us. Can we do really well for people who aren't part of us in the weeks and days ahead? Here's what I want you to write down. That saved people serve people. If you consider yourself a believer and part of the family of God, somebody who is trusted in Jesus Christ, that would make you saved. And if you are saved, you should serve. It's not an optional kind of thing. It's like calling yourself a disciple but not having somebody that you're discipling. You can't really be a disciple. And, and I would suggest that you might not really be saved if you're not serving. Because saved people serve people. The apostles, those who were with them, they, they met and they served the people through many signs and wonders. Okay, so let me just explain what we're talking about today is reaching out, not just in. And we've been going through tangible kingdom and we're trying to make a difference in the communities and the people around us and um, like a whole nother world was opened up, at least to me this week, of, of people who have been in the hospital and have had a butterfly on their door, which means that there's been an infant death. And there are people here in this congregation, friends of mine who have lost children. And it's not fun. But you know what? There are people that don't have any hope in Jesus. I don't know how you can get through this. Laura went to the uh, chiropractor, um, and, you know, the guy asked her how she was doing. And without even thinking about it, she's like, I don't know how people do this without Jesus. He's like, what are you talking about? And she just explained what it is. Like, I don't know how people can do this without Jesus. There are people who are having to go through stuff like that without Jesus. So if we're saved, we should serve people like that. Now, that might not be your calling, but who are you going to serve? Because there are tons of people that aren't one of us, and they don't have Jesus that need to be served. And so, here's the best way. I'm just going to give you from this chapter, or from this little section here, some of the things I think we can pull from the text on the best way to reach out, okay? So, number one, Okay, the, the first thing that you can say, there were many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. One of the best ways that we can reach out is to serve through the power of Jesus. Because some of us, we hear, you know, saved people serve, so what can I do? And, you know, we're going to go and do something nice for somebody, you know. It's about to be fall, so we'll show up in a neighborhood and we'll rake leaves. And that would be great. I don't think anybody would be upset about it. We've, we've got people who've been, showed up at Discovery because we showed up in their neighborhood and raked leaves. But what I'm talking about is we serve through the power of Jesus. And this is making the kingdom tangible, which is bringing forth the blessing of God. And so you can serve through the power of Jesus. Again, you look back to Acts 2, um, 2.47 where they were praising God and having the favor with all people, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. 
here, here's what you can see from just back then in Acts, in, in the second chapter when they're all together and they're just praising God, they're hanging out, they're eating together, they're learning together, they're just all about them being on the inside. They're serving one another so that nobody has needs. Even when we serve one another and we do it in the power of Jesus, the Lord adds to our number, those who are being saved. And so, just so you know that this isn't something that they were just coming up with, if you back up, and I'll put it in your note sheet here, but here's what the believers were doing. As they're serving people, who aren't some of them, you know, they help a guy who can't walk, get up and walk, and he's running around the temple causing a big commotion, and everybody's impressed. But that got him arrested. And when they get out, they pray. And here's part of what they prayed, and it's in your notes there. He said, now, Lord, look upon the threats, and they were being threatened because they were blessing other people. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you, you might want to circle that, stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So when they reached out to people, they were serving, not in their own strength and by their own power, but they were praying and God was doing what they'd prayed, that he would stretch out his hand and heal and signs and wonders would be performed through the name of his holy servant, Jesus. Everything that was happening was through the power of Jesus. And so if we're going to serve people, we do it through the power of Jesus. We do it with the purpose of Jesus as well, just like we talked about last week. That's why we take care of the people who are in the community. The purpose of Jesus. Now we do it with the power of Jesus. When you look at uh, verse 12, and the signs and wonders, they're being done regularly, so obviously this is a God thing. And then it says, and they were all together in Solomon's portico, which is just like it was in chapter 2, it's just like it is in chapter 4, here's the chapter 5, they're all together. So if you're going to serve, here's what we want you to do. Do it together. Do it together. You're not called to just serve alone. Now, this isn't a new idea, just in case you didn't know. Like, and I'm not trying to give you just practical things to do. This is the example that God himself has set. Why? Because God the Father is one with his Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we call the Trinity, and they're, they're one. Three in one, okay? Don't understand it. Don't ask me to explain it. It's, that's just how it is. It's a mystery, which is God. Three in one. And yet, God the Father works together with his Son, who sends the Holy Spirit to work with us. Do you see how... Like, this is a modeled pattern that when we serve, when God serves us, he sends Jesus. When Jesus serves us, he sends the Holy Spirit. They work together. And so if we're going to serve other people, we work together. And so Kevin and I work together to help put together a funeral. A celebration of life, actually. Tommy and Ginger work together to open up their home and Sharon and and Suzanne and Laura, other people worked together to gather, make sure that there was food. So nobody had, like, we, we did it together. I didn't even know what was going on half the time. That's fine. That's how it's supposed to work. That's how it works inside, but that's how it should work outside, too. We serve together. And so if you're going to go somewhere and you're going to serve someplace, bring somebody with you. Just do it together. Okay? Because they were all together in Solomon's portico. This is, people knew that there was something different about them. It wasn't just this random person. In verse 13, this is one that I've had underlined in like all my Bibles because it's, it's a weird statement. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So like nobody wants to be with them, but they really think they're cool. It's kind of like, like when you're around somebody who's, um, I don't know if you call it famous, but I remember going with my kids. Um, some of you may know this or not. We, we went... Um, I don't even remember which kids it was, so it doesn't really matter. But we went someplace, and there was, like, Duncan the Donut Repairman or something like that. Anybody remember that? It was, it's a Christian thingy. Yeah, it's cheesy, exactly. Duncan the Donut Repairman. Anyway, 
but, but we were there, and, and some of them thought it was really cool, and so here's, he's really cool. He's highly regarded by these people in my little house. And they didn't dare go up and talk to him because they were just overwhelmed by how cool he was. And, and just, I don't understand this. Like, it, it doesn't make sense to me, but then it kind of does. That nobody dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people, or but the people held them in high esteem. Here's, here's what I think that we need to maybe take from this when it comes to our relationship with outsiders. Our job is to help close the distance. So let me, let me explain that. Because we can see that there's distance. Like, not going to join you, pretty awesome. But there's this gap between here. Like, I'd like to be like you, but I don't want to be with you. What, what does that mean? I think here's what it means. Remember what happened right before we read about this? Ananias and Sapphira go, they sell some stuff, they get some money, they give it, and yet they didn't give everything. And so what happens? Dead. Okay, so if you were um, looking at a group of people that took their faith that seriously, and suddenly somebody who is really trying to honor and give, like, I mean, they sold a bunch of land and they give a bunch of money, and the next thing you know, they drop dead. Because somebody says, you have not lied to man, but to God. Boom, dies. Wife comes in, asks the same question. Did you really get that much? Okay, well, the same people who uh, carried out your husband are going to carry you out. Boom, dead. If you saw that, would you really want to risk being a part of it? Oh, I'll sign up for that. As here they're trying to do a good thing. The, the distance that we're talking about here is a, is a distance that can only be bridged by, by Jesus. And so there's this gap. And, and we need to go to them because, like this says, they're not going to come to us. And so if we're going to bridge this gap, if we're going to close the distance with the people who do not know Jesus, who are not part of the family of God yet, luckily... Thank God, we don't have a church building, so we don't have a sign out front that says, everybody welcome. I don't know if I've told you this story before, but the church that I worked at in Florida, um, it was Kings Avenue Baptist Church, and it was on Kings Avenue. And they had like 10 acres. And then maybe a year after I got there, there was a development behind it. And so um, suddenly, we're in a residential neighborhood. And there's all these new homes right behind it new people moving in and they're not part of the church and so I'm leading the youth and I'm like hey why don't we go and you know serve them and so I said guys bring your lawnmowers we'll go mow lawns okay you know we got a day off of school everybody will do that and I got, I got told no because that wouldn't work well with insurance what if they cut their foot off it's okay so we won't mow lawns I'm like um, hey you guys have a day off of school let's set up at the entrance to the neighborhood and uh, we'll just hand out donuts and coffee to everybody as they're leaving to go to work and I, I didn't tell them that we were going to do that, so we got permission. We did that. But then the church was going to have a church picnic. You know, as a good Baptist church, that's what you do. You have, like, a potluck or a picnic, okay? I'm like, there's, like, 250 homes here. We should invite them. Do you know what I was told? We'll put it on the sign. So we can't go knock on their doors and just say, hey, we'd like you guys to come over um, you know, we're going to have games and grill out and stuff. You don't need to bring anything. Just bring your family. Nah, we'll just, we'll just put it on the sign. So I'm glad that we don't have a church where you can just put something on the sign and say, hey, yeah, you guys are welcome. And, and for those of you who invite people to church, that's good. I, I appreciate that. Did you go to invite them or did it just come up in conversation? Like, we need, to, we need to go where people are hurting. We need to go where people have need. We need to help close the distance because they're not going to come to us. And so I got, I got basically three things that I think it makes a little sense to me. None of the rest dared join them. Why does it say dared? Okay, any of you, like one of my favorite Christmas movies about time is The Christmas Story. You know, you'll shoot your eye out. But there's this one scene, you guys remember, and it's cold outside, and they're outside, and they're gathered around the flagpole, and they're talking about how your tongue's going to stick. No, it won't. Yeah, it will. You know, I, do, I, I dare you. I double dare you. I double dog dare you. You know, he skipped etiquette. And, uh, and so 
he sticks his tongue to it, and he's getting close, and somebody just pushes it, and, and it's stuck. And I grew up in Minnesota. We stuck our tongue to the, like, windows on the bus. Okay, did you ever do that? Well, you didn't ride a bus. So. Totally missed out, buddy. But, but literally, like, sometimes it, it'd be like a dare on the bus, and there would be sometimes you'd get on, and there was, like, tongue tissue on a bus window. No lie. It was like a badge of a, who was that? But anyway, he sticks a tongue, uh, stuck, stuck. But the, the whole deal there was there was this, there was a dare, and the dare meant that there was some risk involved. Okay, there's some, I'm not sure I want to do this. I'm not really comfortable with it. And so if we're going to close the distance with people who are not part of the family of God yet, we need to understand their discomfort. We need to understand that for, for us to invite somebody to church into our turf, no risk for us. This is us. We're comfortable. I'm happy here. But if they walk in here, um, have, you, have you seen how Christians act? There's a risk. They... they there is a risk to show up on our turf. So if we're going to close the gap, maybe we should take the risk because they're not going to dare join us. Now, there are multiple ways that you can do this, and, and I'm just going to give you kind of a blanket, and it's not, not a, a thing to write down unless you want to, but it's, it's basically how do we do that? If, they're, if no one else dare join them, they're just uncomfortable, so we need to make them comfortable. And by that, I don't mean saying... Yeah, whatever you do is fine, you know, oh yeah, you're totally a sinner, and, uh, and, and all this kind of, like, we're not, I'm not saying that that makes everything okay. That's not what I'm saying. But we have to make them comfortable, so maybe instead of inviting them to, to church. You know, this is, this is why, honestly, um, some of you don't like the fact that we do fight nights. You know, like we watch UFC where guys beat the bloody pulp out of other, each other. And it's a regulated, it's literally a sport, and it's regulated, and nobody's ever died. Okay? So it's much safer than football, which many of you watch. Uh, that's not a joke, by the way. That's, that's true. Nobody's died in UFC, um, but people have died playing football. Um, but anyway, the reason we do this is because you really don't expect that from a church. And yet, we've got three different churches that show up here on a relatively regular basis. Open Door's got a bunch of guys, they come. Covenant sometimes has guys that they come. We sit there, we watch it. Okay, why? Because there are guys that would never set foot in a church, but they'll go watch a fight. And so we're just trying to make them comfortable. We're trying to close the distance. It's not nearly as risky to come and eat chicken wings and watch a, a sporting event as it is to show up on a Sunday morning and not know what the heck I'm talking about when I say, turn in your Bibles or use your phone, and they're like, I don't have either. Okay, so we need, to, we need to understand their discomfort, and that's one of the ways that we can close the distance. Number two, earn their respect. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Okay, so, so here's, here's kind of how I, how I understand that. I am sure that there was a lot of disagreement between the family of God believers, these new believers who believe that Jesus was who he said he was and that he resurrected from the dead and that he was alive and he, was, he offered himself as a sacrifice for them and, and he changed the entire Jewish system. And I'm sure that there were people who, who totally disagreed with that. But that disagreement did not turn into dislike. And so if we're going to earn people's respect, we need to help them understand that even though we disagree, we don't dislike you. And so you know, an example would be like, I, I strongly disagree with the, uh, the Mormons. And, and the reason I disagree is because they preach a Jesus that is different than the Jesus that's recorded in Scripture. Well, they still talk about Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. And, and, and heaven and hell is a whole lot of different things. You know, women, you're in trouble if you're Mormon because you don't have a chance unless you get married and then you have a spiritual husband who brings you into a spiritual dwelling. You know, that's your only hope then you have to populate your own spiritual universe because you become a god. That's why they have so many children. Even, even the average Mormon doesn't maybe know this. So I disagree with them, but guess what? I really admire them. They've earned my respect. Why? Because they go for two years on mission trips. You ever seen any of them? 
And they ride around on their bicycles, white shirts, little tag that says elder so-and-so. They have great respect. So disagreement doesn't have to mean dislike. And we as Christians and part of the family of God should be able to disagree with people without causing there to be some dislike. Because sin is something that separates us from God, but it doesn't have to separate us from one another. Okay? There are messy people out there. Some of you have met them. And that's okay. But we don't have to show up and be bubble-wrapped Christians who just can't be polluted by the world, which means that we can't ever be among them. Uh, that, that's not how it works. And so we need to earn their respect by not just walking away from them or, or making them feel as though we dislike them. Okay, so think about your neighbor. Does, does your neighbor um, know Jesus? Is your neighbor part of the family of God? If you don't know because you've never had that conversation, well, how could you close the distance? between you and your neighbor. You, you could just understand that there's some discomfort. Maybe you don't start with spiritual conversations. You just find out, you know, hey, what are you growing in your garden? Or did you get a new car? Or, hey, you know, could I help you pressure wash your house? Or whatever it is, I don't know. It, but close the distance. Understand that there's some discomfort, but you, you have to go to them. They're not going to come to you. And then earn their respect. And a lot of times you can do that just by serving. And saved people serve. And we see that's what the believers were doing. They were hanging out together, but signs and wonders and healings and things were going on among the other people. So we understand their discomfort. We earn their respect. And then the, the last thing, you look at verse 14. More than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Now this is different than when the Lord added to their number daily. This is believers were added to the Lord. So in chapter 2, the Lord added to their number. Now, it's always a work of God. But here, believers were added to the Lord. Now, this is where I say I might be overstating my case, but it just helps me think. If we're going to help close the distance, we need to invite them to change. Okay? And there is a difference. And maybe I've explained it before that Jesus walked this tension between invitation and challenge where he was very inviting but he was also very challenging I mean he said things that were extremely challenging and people didn't like it so they wanted to throw him off the edge of a cliff or everybody let you know eat my body drink my blood that's a little bit invitation but pretty challenging come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest that's pretty invitation not a lot of challenge and Jesus knew how to balance this, not even balance it, because there is no such thing as a balance, because at different times, different people need different things. Sometimes people need to be challenged very directly. Sometimes they need to be invited very specifically. And so if we're going to help close this distance, bridge this gap between people who would never dare join us, and hopefully we've earned their respect so we're, we're highly regarded by them, we need to invite them to change. And so, really what this is like, or at least how I picture it is, you remember when you were in middle school or, or even, if you're going to come play basketball with us tonight, okay, I hate when they do this. Um, you know, we'll sit and shoot free throws to see who's on what team or whatever. But I remember in middle school or even in elementary school, you know, the gym teacher would say, okay, you be a captain and you be a captain. And then they just start picking. And, the, you know, the whole line up there and somebody's last. But what if you're that kid who's normally last and one of the captains goes, oh, I'll, I'll pick you. It's an invitation to change. Now, are they going to think that they're the best in the world? Oh, I got, I got picked by Jimmy. Jimmy's like the most popular kid in school and he put me on his team. I mean, you can imagine some of the stories when they go home. Mom, Mom, guess what happened today? Okay, but there's no, there's no change in their ability. Little Marco there is still a bumbling, clumsy idiot when it comes to throwing balls. But something's changed. He starts to, he's been invited to something different and something changes. Maybe it's his confidence level. Maybe it's his outlook. Maybe it's the way he thinks. And so when we invite people into something, it's not an instant whatever. 
but you have that kind of power and authority. Why? Because you're part of the family of God, and God has given you all power and authority. You're a representative of our Father. And so when you invite somebody, you're, you're literally inviting them to the winning team, and they might feel like they're the last place people. Nobody ever picks me. Nobody likes me. Nobody wants me. Oh, why, don't, why don't you come here? I want you. And so we, we, we invite them to change. And sometimes it starts with how they think. What we don't do is demand that they change. Because remember, we, we covered that. Disagreement doesn't have to mean dislike, and sin is what separates us from God, but it doesn't have to separate us from one another. God works that stuff out. Why? Because if you look back, we serve through the power of Jesus. You read these last couple of verses. So believers are added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and they laid them on cots and mats. That as Peter, just one of the apostles, he came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Okay, now, let's just be honest. Okay, you read that and you go, oh, that's in the Bible. But think about this, okay? Has anybody seen, it's, it's a relatively recent kind of viral video of this little girl who was petrified of her own shadow? You've seen that? Hilarious. Like, I mean, you probably shouldn't laugh at like a, a you know, 18-month-old or something that is literally screaming bloody murder, but it's funny. As she's, you know, can't even really walk, it's kind of like, you know, the toddler stage, and then catches her shadow and horror across her face, and she tries to back, go, just go look it up. You'll be entertained. So imagine for a second, Okay, believing as an adult that that shadow, we know it's a shadow, okay, but the shadow of somebody else could heal you, could heal your loved one. They're, they're literally carrying the sick into the streets and laying them on cots and mats that this one guy walks by and his shadow heals them. This is the kind of power that we're talking about that they had. That's the power of Jesus. It's not the power of Peter or the power of shadows. It's the power of Jesus. And the people gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, and they brought the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Who was healed? The people who were hurting. Anybody who had any need. And so I think what we can learn from this, if we're going to serve people outside the family of God, We just do whatever we can to meet whatever needs we can. Remembering what we started with, that we do it in the power of Jesus. So we meet whatever needs we can. So here's how that worked inside the church this week. I've never had to help a family who has lost a child before. I spent my entire week with Tom and Melissa. I picked him up and we went to the funeral home. We spent hours with the funeral director. I dropped Melissa off and Tom and I went back to the uh, place to purchase a plot for the cemetery. I don't know what else to do, but that needs to be done. And somewhere in the middle of that, Jesus shows up and says what I don't have to say so that there's at least some kind of comfort for them. You just meet whatever needs you can. I called Tommy. I said, hey, look, I got a, I, I, honestly, it's a big favor, and I need you to say no if you need to say no. Like, that's okay, but I'm just letting you know. I'm, I'm going to ask you a big favor. Would you be willing to host a meal after the services for Tom and Melissa and their family? I, mean, I know you'll need to check with Ginger. And, yeah, do what has got to be done. They needed a place, and let's, we'll, we'll do it. Some of you got calls. Will you serve some food? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Hey, would you do this? Yeah, I'll do it. So I'm going to ask you in terms of serving inside, um, would you please, in the next few weeks and months, would you put in your calendar right now if you're that kind of person? Like literally take out your phone, put in, pick a day that you're normally free, put it in at 9 a.m. so it happens in the morning, set a reminder that happens an hour earlier. If you get up late, set it for noon and set a reminder, you know, whatever, and say, call Tom or call Melissa. Or text Tom or text Melissa and just let them know you're thinking about them. Is there anything I can do for you? 
Would you set one for November and December and January? Would you do that? Seriously. If you don't have their information, then, you know, that's fine. Put it in there as a reminder of yourself to pray for them. That's how you can serve needs inside. Just do what needs to be done. They need people to let them know that they're not forgotten. But what about all those people out there? They, they have needs. What needs to be done? I was talking to Bill before. Third Street's having a, a, five, or a 4K and an 8K, and Bill is going to go down there and help register people and take care of things. Why? It needs to be done. What needs to be done? I saw a video earlier. You know how just random stuff shows up in your Facebook feed? I don't even know who it was or what it was, but it, it caught my attention because there's a guy on a motorcycle and a cat in an intersection. Now, normally I'd cheer for the intersection. But I cheered for the cat. And so did the guy on the motorcycle who stops all the semis and stuff like that that are coming. It's like a six-lane undivided highway. And zoom, zoom, zoom. And he literally pulls his motorcycle in the middle of the intersection, stops traffic, picks up this little kitten, and gives it to some lady. <laughs> yes, we do that. Why? Why? Because he just did what needed to be done. He did what needed to be done. So, like, when, when you see needs, what, what are you doing? One of the other things that I saw this week that was very encouraging to me is you know how they use, usually do human experiment videos where they set up a situation and then they see how the people who are experiencing that are going to respond. So, you know, there might be in a restaurant and, and some waiter is like making racist comments at a customer and they see if anybody around there actually is going to stand up for them. Okay, well, I saw one like this where it's, it's girls at a bus stop. These little like tweeners, you know, 11, 12, 13 year old girls. And there's three of them. Two of them are picking on one. They're just saying mean things about it while there's somebody else sitting at the bus stop. Hey, don't you take dance? <laughs> yeah, so-and-so said that uh, you look like an elephant. You can't dance at all. Yeah, and your hair, that's so ugly. I can't, you're never going to find a boyfriend. Nobody's ever going to love you. Didn't your dad die? You don't even have a dad. Like, I mean, literally saying mean stuff. Well, there's an adult sitting right next door. Right next to him. Almost without fail. Every adult. Cut that out. Don't talk like that. You don't need to be like, don't be mean to her. Look, come on, you come sit over here with me. Almost without fail. Why? Because they recognize exactly what was going on. Those people who are on the outside need somebody to just meet whatever needs they can. And that right Right there, that person just needed somebody to say, you count. So they invited him in. Like, and I don't even know if these people were Christians or not, but that sure looks like Jesus. So this is what I'm talking about. What needs to be done? Not just for us, but for people who aren't us. And it's going to require us going to them because they're not going to dare to join us. And so we meet whatever needs we can, but we do it in the power of Jesus. And then this last thing was just when we see the results of it, Whenever you risk serving and loving on people, we have to expect something. I'm just going to tell you, expect God to do what you can't. And, and here's what I mean by that. Why should we expect God to do what we can't? Well, number one, we can't save anybody, which is why it doesn't say saved people save people because we don't save people. Saved people serve people, and we do that in the power of Jesus, which draws people to him. Why do we expect God to do what we can't? Because ultimately, with the risk that's involved, it's God's risk whether people receive what we have to offer, whether they receive good news, whether they receive invitation, whether they even receive our services. I don't know if you've ever gone out and tried to serve around here. When I first moved here, I learned that Eastern North Carolina is not the same as other places. People around here are suspicious. Like you second guess the kindness of strangers. I mean, we would go, um, you know, like around daylight savings time, which is coming up uh, next week. I think next week, don't forget, set your clocks back or you can come early. Um, 
But, but we would show up, we'd buy a bunch of light bulbs, you know, back when you didn't have to buy those stupid kind of light bulbs. And we'd show up and we'd have batteries and light bulbs. We'd say, do you have any, you know, light bulbs you need replaced? And we'd do them inside or outside. And, uh, and then we'd change out the batteries in their smoke detectors. And we'd tell people when we'd show up in their, in their neighborhood, we'd knock on their door or we'd, you know, show up at an apartment building or something and say, hey, can we do this for you? No. Let me make sure you understand. This is a light bulb. And this is a battery. This is all I have. I'm not going to ask you to sign up for anything. You don't have to buy any magazines or candy. You sure you don't want any? No. Okay. That's you guys who are from here. Yes. Well, you're not from here. So you're not weird. You're with me. Huh? It's because you talk funny. Tommy, you get a pass because if I said this publicly right now, I would be sinning. I mean, we'd show up at Watermelon Festival, 4th of July celebration, whatever, and we'd, we'd literally have a sign-up where all you have to just sign up, and you can literally put on your, on your card, do not contact me unless I win. Hey, would you like to be entered for a gift card? No. We'd be at the Watermelon Festival, and it's a sunny day out, like bright, shiny sun, and we've got sunscreen wipes, okay? There's no shade in the Winter Melon, winter, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Winter Melon Water Festival, yeah. The Watermelon, whatever, the Watermelon Festival area at Winterville. And so we've ha we'd have these wipes that you can, you know, put on your little baby or something like this so that they don't get sunburned because they're going to be out there all day. And you'd walk up to somebody, would would you like some wipes? No. Okay. So there's a risk in doing that. We were just at a prayer booth that we set up where we offered to pray with people. Now, Hannah, my daughter, fearless. She'd go up to the biggest, meanest, crankiest looking whatever. Can I pray for you? No. Okay, have a nice day. Like, I don't know how you get upset at that. But she, she overcame her fear and she took the risk. And so we have to expect... God to do what you can't because there's a risk involved, but there's also a reward. The risk is that God will be rejected. He takes that. The reward is you get a new friend. You reach out to somebody who is a, not part of the family of God, and you build a relationship, and you serve them. You go past your discomfort. You go to them. You serve in the power of Jesus. You invite them into things. You take the risk, and God starts drawing them to himself. The reward is you get a new friend. And, and again, this is something that God himself modeled because God, being up in heaven, looks down and he sees us in our sinful state and he goes, I've got to do something. And so he takes the risk of sending his own son, Jesus, here and we get the reward. What's that reward? The reward is that many of us have accepted what God has extended as an invitation, his son, Jesus. And because we've accepted that, we get the reward of being included in the family of God. We have relationship with Jesus. You don't, you don't just get heaven. You get God. And some, some of us, we think that, you know, hey, the thing that I want, you know, I, okay, accept Jesus so I get heaven. You know, I want, I want the good stuff. I want streets of gold and all that kind of stuff. If that's all you're looking for, you totally miss the point. He offered Jesus so that we could have relationship and be part of his family instead of just part of a family. And so we expect God to do what we can because we can't make people be part of his family. So God takes the risk, sends Jesus, and we get the reward. If you've never accepted that, you're missing out. And the good news is it's, it's not a limited time offer beyond how limited you are to how long you're here. You know, because like when you expire, the offer expires. But if you want to be part of the family of God, it's literally just saying, okay, thank you, Jesus, you died for me. God sent you to do that for me. Why? Because I messed up and I can't fix it? Oh. What do I have to do? You know, it's like he's offering you a light bulb and a battery, and you're like, nah. But it's free. Nah. You want some sunscreen? Nah. Do you want eternal life? Do you want to be part of the family of God? Who would say no to that? I don't know, but some people do, and that's a risk that God takes.
but we need to be willing to join in and expect God to do what only He can do. So, at the end of the day here, what are you, you going to do? Okay, you guys are going through tangible kingdom. Okay, we're trying to figure out how to be a blessing in a tangible way and bring the kingdom of God to earth. You know, your kingdom come on earth here, be done as it is in heaven. And it's totally different there. Like, babies don't die in heaven. There's no mourning, there's no crying, there's no pain in heaven. There's no people who are without. There are no homeless, there are no starving. Um, we, we just don't have those problems in heaven. There's no bullying. There's no financial trouble. There's no homelessness. Like, all the things that we see and encounter here, there aren't kids who are hungry in heaven. So, so what are you going to do to meet needs in the power of Jesus? What are you going to risk? Where are you going to go so that the people who will not dare join us will respect you because you've crossed that barrier, reached out to them? I don't know what that looks like in your individual cases. But I, I do know that that is something that saved people do. Saved people serve people. So I'm going to give you a little reflection time here. I'm going to put some questions up that I want you to think about. Before you do, if you're writing anything down or, or just pops into mind, and you can argue with this if you want. You don't have to write it down, but God might give somebody to your mind. Who do you need to serve? Who is somebody who's not part of the family of God that you need to reach out to? And it might be a risk. It might be uncomfortable. But what's the name that pops to mind? What's, what is the name of that person or that family or that place that you need to go out of this community so that you can help draw them into our community? Let me pray. Father, Thank you that you set the example. God, that you work together in your holiness as the Father sent the Son and the Son sent the Holy Spirit. And, and Father, you serve us by giving your life. And then you've taken the risk so that we can reap the reward. And God, would you help us to live as saved people who serve people in the same way that the Father served us? by giving us Jesus. Would you draw to our minds names of people God, that aren't part of the family of God that we don't have to look on with pity and we don't have to judge them or anything like that. Father, we just serve them and we just love them. Who is it that we can do that for? And then God, we pray that same prayer of boldness that the disciples prayed right before this. God, that we would be able to speak with boldness you would testify to the fact that you're still at work. There's just signs and wonders. God, you would move in the hearts and the lives of people through us. We expect you to do what we can, God. Would you draw people to yourself as we reach out to them in your name. Amen.